And the psychedelic trance allows us to see the stars at noon because it simply eclipses the sun of egoic awareness. It reduces the obfuscation and allows us to see more. At the same time, it also reduces self-reflection. This reduction of self-reflection is a clue, I think, and that's my, my, my personal myth, if you will, my personal worldview. It is a clue to the meaning of of ordinary life. We pay a huge price for living the lives of regular human beings. Uh, we've become apparently, seemingly unconscious of the enormous, inconceivable breadth and depth of what's really going on, of the broader reality. Um, and we pay that price in order to attain self-reflection in order to be able to think about our thoughts, in order to be able to evaluate our own mentation critically as an object of mentation. Only under this state of self-reflection are we able to ask the key critical questions about existence. Questions like, who or what am I? What am I trying to do? Where should I go? What is the meaning of it all? What does this all mean? These are questions that you can't ask when you are operating in, in an instinctive dream state. Again, just think about your nightly dreams. You're not asking critical questions in your dream. You find yourself in a room with some strange people and you never stop to ask, uh, how did I end up here? What am I doing here? Um, who are these people? Where am I supposed to go next? You don't ask those questions because you're not in a self-reflective state. I don't think our self-reflective state can, can produce answers. The answers arise from the broader mind, from mind at large, the processes that we experience, for instance, during uh, incursions into our intuitive and mental spheres or even during dreams. But our self-reflective, ordinary, egoic state allows us to ask the right questions. And asking questions is key. It triggers mind to produce its own answers, to transform its potentials into actualities. It realizes the potentials of mind. This, this transformation of potential into actuality is triggered by asking the right questions. And I think that is that is the key point of what we are doing here. Another point that um, we often confront in our, in our psychedelic reveries is the nature of divinity. I mean, I think most of us have had experiences of, of a divine order, at least something that we cognize as a divine order during, during our journeys. And um, what I'm suggesting to you at the same time is that at a very foundational level it's all us it's all you it's all mind at large and what is mind at large? it is you that sense of I-ness that you experience right now is the same sense of I-ness of mind at large it's the same sense of I-ness that you had when you were a five-year-old kid and although nothing remains in you from that time when you were five years old. I mean, every molecule in your body has changed, your, your thoughts have changed, your memories have changed, everything has changed, but you still have that same intrinsic sense of I. My point is that it's that sense of I that you feel deep inside you right now that is mind at large. It is you. It's nothing else. How can we then reconcile that with the idea of a divinity, right? If it's you, you know you aren't divine. <laughs> At least I know that. Um, I think the key insight here is that once whirlpools form in the broader stream of mind at large, what, and because whirlpools have this reverberation process within them that obfuscate everything going on outside the whirlpools and even in the periphery of the whirlpool, what you have is a process of dissociation. You know, people with a dissociative identity disorder, 
They have multiple personalities, multiple alters, as uh, psychiatrists call the different personalities. Each personality has its own stream of perceptions, thoughts, opinions, um, personal characteristics, and so forth. And they are often not aware of the other personalities. So in one single mind, a personal psyche, you can have multiple alters, multiple dissociated complexes of that psyche. So what I'm suggesting is that mind at large, God, if you will, has dissociative identity disorder, and we are its alters. We are its dissociated complexes. So the I is the same. That inner sense of I is the same. But the particular stream of thoughts, emotions, opinions, things you identify yourself with is different. So from the point of view of an alter, a particular dissociated complex, which is the point of view we hold 99.9% of the time in our lives, the rest of mind at large is other. It's the other. It's something else from that limited, localized whirlpool perspective. And how does the other appear to us during consensus reality in our ordinary states, not, 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 not during a psychedelic trance, in our ordinary reality. What, what evidence is there for the rest of mind at large? Well, think with me, bear along with me. If I put a person in a brain scanner and I measure the, the, the neuronal activity in that person, I have an outside picture of the person's uh, direct experience. Suppose the person uh, is watching erotic material and feels aroused. Then I scan the person's brain and I have an image of that arousal in the form of a pattern of activity in the person's neurons. Obviously, that image isn't arousal. I wouldn't feel aroused from watching neurons fire in somebody's head. But it is the outside image of the experience of arousal that the person has. I suggest to you that the world at large, nature, the planets, the stars, uh, the moons, uh, the galaxies, the, the, the nebula, uh, everything is the outside image of non-localized processes, mental processes, in mind at large. In other words, for exactly the same reason that a brain scan is the outside image of a person's experiences, the world, the universe, is the outside image of God's first-person experiences. As a matter of fact, there has been a study done a couple of years ago um, in which researchers concluded that the pattern of connectivity at the highest level in the universe, uh, across galaxy clusters, the distribution of dark energy, how the whole thing is distributed and interconnected. At a very technical level, it is very similar to the pattern of connectivity and distribution in brains. In other words, the universe at the highest level looks like a brain. To me, this isn't surprising at all. The universe is the image of God's mentation, of God's cognitive processes. The processes of mind at large that are not localized in the form of a whirlpool. The processes that are localized in the form of a whirlpool look like biology. They look like life. They look like people, dogs, cats, bacteria, and so on and so forth. So I think what we ordinarily perceive as the world out there, as this external, apparently autonomous, uh, standalone reality that we perceive around us uh, in our everyday lives, is the brain scan of God, if you will. It's the outside image of the processes unfolding uh, in mind at large. And from that perspective, it is the second person view of the experiences of God, the outside view of the experiences of God, in the same way that a neuroscientist has an outside view of the experience of arousal by looking at a brain scan. 
I think the mystery of death, which is which comes